Paper Mario is the shit. It's a wonderful and charming RPG full of lovable characters, fantastic environments and locations, and it's a lot of fun to play. It was my introduction to the genre of role-playing games, and I thought it'd be fun to talk about it a little bit today. If you're familiar with the series, you know that it's kind of divisive and has a bit of an identity crisis. The first two games are mostly traditional role-playing games, with unique settings and characters and writing and stuff. Back in 1996, Nintendo and Square co-developed and published Super Mario RPG on the Super Nintendo, and it was kind of a big deal. Before that game came out, there wasn't really much in the Mario series in the vein of storytelling, or really any opportunity to explore the Mushroom Kingdom all that much at all. You just played as the funny Italian man and jumped on turtles and saved the princess and shit. It wasn't anything more than that. But when the Mario series started expanding into spin-offs like these RPGs, there was ample opportunity to explore the world that Mario and his buddies live in, in great detail, and people responded positively to it. The games have the benefit of just being really good RPGs on top of being captivating and cleverly written and stuff. They're just really likable little experiences and it makes sense why the series matters to so many people. The first divisive game in the series is 2007's Super Paper Mario on the Wii. It abandons the RPG battle mechanics and a few other things that people really liked about the first two games, so some people aren't too hot on it. And that's understandable, I think, but I personally really love Super Paper Mario because it still retains the soul, for lack of a better term, of the first two games. Super Paper Mario even exceeds the first two entries in the series in some ways by amping up the weirdness factor to 11. It's honestly a wild ride. There's a dating simulator section where Peach gets kidnapped by this fucking neckbeard permavirgin incel lizard guy. This game came out in 2007, it's fucking incredible. After Super Paper Mario, the series was dormant for five years until Nintendo released Sticker Star on 3DS. I know this game has its fans, but it's a hollow imitation of the first two games. At this point in time, Nintendo was really kind of eradicating all of that weird GameCube stuff, and a lot of their IPs started going in a very clean, easy to digest direction. And at the same time, they seemingly took the feedback of people unhappy with the lack of turn-based battles in Super Paper Mario to heart, while also deciding that they needed to do that Nintendo thing where they innovate, and what we're left with is a pretty boring experience. I haven't played enough of Sticker Star or the following Color Splash to really confidently talk about them at length, but I don't really enjoy them very much. They're not bad games, but they're bad Paper Mario games, if that makes sense. If these games had a different IP attached to them with completely original characters completely separate from Paper Mario, they'd probably be hated less by people, but then they'd also probably not be very popular or sell very well. So, Origami King is one that I have played quite a decent amount of, but I'll save my thoughts on that one specifically for a bit later on. I don't want to start things out by whining too much. Let me get back to Paper Mario 64. Paper Mario was originally designed to be a direct sequel to Mario RPG on the Super Nintendo, but some game industry shenanigans happened at Square merged with Enix to become Squeenix, and their relationship with Nintendo changed. Whatever. Shit happens. Nintendo obviously could still make whatever Mario games they wanted because it was their intellectual property, but a lot of the elements of Mario RPG are owned by Square Enix now, so Nintendo couldn't outright make a sequel with the characters and enemies introduced specifically for that game. No big deal, they knew a Mario themed role playing game would do numbers, so they still wanted to make it and release it. Instead of being Mario RPG, they leaned into the storybook aesthetic that they were working with and they called the game Paper Mario in the West. In Japan, it's just called Mario Story, the paper stuff isn't really that important to the first few games in the series, it's just a name and an art style choice. Again, I'll revisit all this shit later, let me just get started talking about the game already, I can't believe I'm making another fucking hour long video. Paper Mario starts out kind of similarly to Mario 64 with Mario receiving a letter from Princess Peach inviting him to the castle, only this time Luigi's also invited. It's really nice of Luigi to read the letter out loud for Mario, who is famously illiterate. The brothers immediately leave their house, and in an acute automated sequence they walk through Toad Town to go to the castle to attend the big party that the princess is throwing. I like this sequence a lot because it immediately shows off the world of the game and it feels a lot more organic and real for the brothers to walk there instead of Mario just appearing outside of the castle with a warp pipe or whatever. It's less video gamey and more cinematic I feel like. We reach the castle and this is the first part of the game where we have control over Mario. You can walk around, jump, talk to all the guests and royal servants and stuff. It's really neat.
God damn, a lot of these toads love to gossip, don't they? Why don't you mind your fucking business, dude? These royal maid toads are really cute, though. Talking about how restless the princess has been waiting for Mario to show up. You know that thing that some women do where they, like, giggle and whisper to each other and shit when you come into the room? Of course you don't. I don't either. This is the most unrealistic game I've ever played. While we're wandering around the castle looking for Princess Peach, I'll take a second to compliment the visual design. I love the colors and gradients and how much effort obviously went into modeling all this stuff. It's really nice to see so much detail on display. This definitely is consistent throughout the entire game. I love this game's visuals a lot. It's also really cool that the framework for Princess Peach's castle is obviously based on Mario 64's version of it, but expanded upon and given a lot more detail and refinement. Kind of a good parallel to what this game means for the Mario series in my opinion. Anyway, let's head upstairs to see Peach. Oh, she's the type of girl that uses heart emojis when she texts, isn't she? That's cute. Princess Peach isn't really what I'd generally call a good example of a strong female video game character, but I think that's a problem with most Mario characters, not just the female ones. None of these guys ever really have a chance to have much depth outside of these spin-off RPGs where they finally have a chance to be actual characters with feelings and emotions and shit. Peach spends most of this game being the typical damsel in distress again, which whatever, but she actually does things in this game, with moments where you actually get to play as her and stuff. We'll get to that in a bit, but I just wanted to mention it real quick while the thought was in my head. Suddenly the ground starts to shake and the castle is lifted up really high in the sky, way past the fucking stratosphere up to the edge of space. You know, I looked this shit up and to get so high that you start seeing space and the stars around you and stuff, you have to get close to 62 miles above sea level. You drink like four bottles of cough syrup. Uh oh, it's Bowser. Who could have seen this coming? We begin our first battle with him, but it's scripted. We can't do anything to stop him here. The intro cutscene of this game shows Bowser stealing this magic star rod from the star people that can be used to grant anyone's wish. Its purpose is to stay in Star Haven where the star people live, so people's wishes can be granted. Once Bowser steals the star rod though, he essentially becomes omnipotent, and he seals away the star spirits, who are basically like seven entities that guard the star rod and are very powerful and magical or whatever. It's a decent enough plot, light years ahead of what we had up until this point, you know? Once Bowser defeats Mario, he hits us with a bolt of lightning from the star rod and Mario flies out of the castle window and falls towards the earth before we're shown what I can only describe as the hardest title drop of all time. God damn, it's so fucking good! I love the ethereal pads in the background and the melody fading in as the title of the game materializes at the same time. The music in this game is some of the best on the N64, too. I'll talk about it a little more in depth soon, but for now let's see how Mario is doing. He fell back to Earth and landed in some forest. The star spirits use their powers to astrally project to where he is to check in and make sure that he isn't dead. I like that when the star spirits are communicating with Mario from a distance, their dialogue text in the UI is like, faded. It's a nice touch. The UI design in general is really well done. The dialogue windows being shaped like comic book bubbles is cute, and the status menu looking like a file folder is a nice touch as well. Again, the paper stuff is kind of subtly there, but it's enough of a background element that you can kind of ignore it. It might seem silly to point out the UI, but a good UI in a video game really does go a long way, I think. The Star Spirits deduce that Mario is, in fact, not dead yet, and they reserve their power to speak with him later. Mario is approached by a young Goomba girl, and after a few failed attempts to get him to respond, she runs off to tell her family that the famous Mario is outside of their village, unconscious. The oldest and wisest Star Spirit, Eldstar, communicates to Mario one more time while he's unconscious, inside an inn in the village, begging him to come to Shooting Star summit as soon as he can. They have some shit to discuss. Mario wakes up and the owner of the inn, this toad, lets Mario know where he is and stuff. You know, I'm not sure if this is just something I personally experienced or if this is something other people can relate to, but when I was a kid I liked to read stories a lot, and this game was the first I ever played that had a serious amount of dialogue to read in it. When you're a little kid, I feel like when 
when you read a word for the first time, you remember the context of where you read it, and it sticks in your head for a while. Whenever I hear or see the word village, I think about Goomba Village. I really enjoyed that this game felt like a novel mixed with a video game. I don't think about it that much, but this game honestly was a landmark for me. I had never played anything quite as cinematic and well written before this. I didn't play stuff like Pokemon until way after this game. I didn't own a Game Boy Advance or any other portable game systems until after the GameCube had come out a few years after this game's release, but uh. We leave the inn and the Goomba family all talk to us and are relieved that we're okay. Now you may be thinking, why do these Goombas give two fucks about Mario in the first place? Don't Goombas hate Mario? Well, this game explores the notion that a lot of the enemies previously seen in other Mario games are actual species that cohabitate the Mushroom Kingdom, along with the people and toads and stuff. It's pretty neat, honestly. The Goombas and Koopas and other bad guys that actually attack Mario in this game and the next either work for Bowser or just have anger issues or BPD or whatever. Kami Koopa is Bowser's advisor in this game. She's kind of funny. She's a magic Koopa like Kamek in Yoshi's story, but she's like one of the most powerful ones, so she seems to have risen in the ranks to be Bowser's right hand man. She comes by to check on Mario and blocks his path with a big obstacle so he can't get out before flying off. No big deal. The Goomba Grandpa was doing some work out back last we saw. Let's go borrow his hammer so we can break the block. <laughs> I really like when the game is a little silly like this. The sense of humor is subtle and it's understated and it's it's just nice. We find the grandpa on the hammer and we're greeted by this infant that's really pissed off for some reason. The battle system in Paper Mario is kind of a work of genius, but we don't actually have access to our full combat potential yet, so I'll talk about it in a minute. We make our way back to the village and the cool Goomba grandpa lets us keep... Cool Goomba grandpa. Goomba grandpa. <laughs> the cool Goomba Grandpa lets us keep the hammer and gives us a badge to help us on our journey as well. Badges in this game are special items that we can collect and equip that give us access to special moves that we can use during battles, and sometimes outside of battles. Basically in Paper Mario you have three stats, HP, FP, and BP. HP is pretty obvious, it's how much health Mario has. FP stands for flower points, and it's basically your magic or mana meter. Whenever you use a move other than the standard jump or hammer attacks, you use FP and you won't be able to use those moves if you're too low on it. BP is badge points, and the more badge points you have, the more badges you can equip. FP and BP kind of go hand in hand, and the game is a lot more fun with the more of these that you have. You get a choice every time you level up to pick one of these to put more points into. It's great that the game gives you the opportunity to kind of play Play it how you want. You can play through the entirety of the game without upgrading Mario's health at all if you want a challenge. It's cool. We take the badge that Grandpa gave us, and we let Goombario come along with us. He's our first partner character. The game overall has seven of them that'll join us on our journey, but in many ways this guy is my favorite. Each partner character comes with their own abilities that'll help Mario out throughout the game, and Goombario specifically gives this game a lot of personality. His ability is that he'll inform Mario about any area we're in, or any characters we come across, and sometimes he sprinkles in his own funny little opinionated commentary. It really makes the world feel a lot more alive and I always like having him around. These two characters just go together, like peanut butter and jelly, or a pack of menthol cigarettes and Ryo Fukui's 1976 album Scenery. If you know, you know. We make our way back to Toad Town to the west, but we're stopped by some of Bowser's goons, the Goomba Brothers and the Goomba King. These guys are easy. We can use Goombario's tattle ability in combat, and he'll usually give us a hint on the best way to defeat the enemy, but I've played this game 4,000 times, and I know that this fight is over in 10 seconds if you slap the spiky seeds out of this tree with Mario's hammer. Boom. After we take care of these losers, we head towards Toad Town. Everyone is amazed that Mario isn't dead, but come on, dude. He's super fucking Mario. Would you fuck with this guy if you saw him in the street? Of course you wouldn't. Italian excellence is what he is. You know, I was re-watching The Sopranos the other day and Tony actually plays Mario Kart with his kid. I wonder what the general opinion on Super Mario is within the Italian mob. Like, they probably appreciate the positive representation, right? I don't know. If anybody watching this is an Italian gangster and you also have particularly notable opinions about the Super Mario series, please DM me on Twitter. I have a really fucking stupid idea for a podcast. We should probably get home and see if Luigi is okay. He was at the party when the castle got hijacked, right?
Luigi, stop being a neurotic bitch. You know, I'm really glad Luigi actually gets to talk. He takes a back seat in this game, but it's really funny seeing him speak with Mario while Mario hits him with that INTJ stare. Mario is still a pretty decently interesting character in this series though. He emotes and reacts to stuff in an understated way that makes him seem like he's just a quiet guy. He never feels blank or stoic, you know? He emotes a lot more in games like Super Mario RPG and Superstar Saga on the Game Boy Advance, up to a ridiculous and comedic degree even. And I like those portrayals of him as well, but I'm really fond of him in the first three Paper Mario games especially. He's just a consistently nice presence despite never saying anything, and I'm always happy to play as him here. What were we doing again? Despite the fact that Princess Peach's castle is miles in the sky and the kingdom is in turmoil, this game has such a cozy and relaxed atmosphere, you can really follow the story at your own pace. It's a lot of fun to just run around and talk to NPCs with Goombario and stuff. It rocks. Oh yeah, Shooting Star Summit. Let's head up there and make contact with the Star Spirits so they can instruct us on what the fuck we need to do to save Peach and give Bowser a wedgie. I love Shooting Star Summit. It features my favorite song in the game. I love when this game's soundtrack uses atmospheric pads and this song specifically really stuck in my head as a kid. It definitely influenced my taste in music and my sensibilities as a guy that makes music. By the way, you can listen to the music that I make at soundcloud.com slash fuckmyass. The spirits tell us that we need to find all seven of them and free them from Bowser's clutches so they can charge their power together so we can kick his ass. The Star Rod makes him invincible, but if we free all seven of the Star Spirits, we can beat him. Cool. The game shifts to show us what's going on up in the castle with Peach and Bowser. She's pretty depressed about her situation, understandably. She desperately wishes for someone to come and help her when this star kid shows up and introduces himself. Ah, I, I bet it is, buddy. I bet that is your name. That's, that's great. Twink is only a youngster, so he can't grant big wishes yet, but he takes a special item from Peach that she wants Mario to have and sends him off to go find him. We also learn that Bowser enlisted the help of these Ninja Turtle Koopa guys called the Koopa Bros. They're guarding the star spirit Eldstar. Anyway, control is given back to us, and before we do anything else, I want to go see my favorite character in the game because she lives in Shooting Star Summit. Oh, to be a faceless, hooded character in a video game with magic powers. Merlovely can let us know where to go to find secret items and stuff, and her little brother Merlo will give us rare badges in exchange for star pieces. You find star pieces scattered throughout the game, all over, and if you collect enough of them, you can get some pretty sick badges for them. This one that ups Mario's attack power makes the game way, way easier. I love Gumbario's little commentary in the house here. Yeah, you're a ladies man, aren't you big guy? There's also this chest here that's kinda cool. Later on when you play as Peach, you'll find that there's a chest that looks identical to it in the castle. You can use it to send Mario special items that you find up in the castle. It's a neat addition, but I always kinda laugh because it definitely looks big enough for Peach to just like, climb into. Like just climb into the magic teleporting chest dude, you can escape. I don't know, maybe she's claustrophobic. Oh hey, it's Twink. <laughs> I can get over it. I can I can accept that his name is Twink. I can I can say that straight faced. It's just a name. Twink. He gives us the item Peach wanted us to have, and now we finally can use the action command during battle. Finally I get to talk about this game's insanely good battle system. Paper Mario already stands a bit above the shoulders of other RPGs that existed at the time it came out because it incorporates elements in the overworld from platformer games. In most RPGs at the time, you just kind of walked around in a grid or a flat area or whatever, just kind of traveling around, but in Paper Mario, you do jumping and platforming and shit. It's more video gamey, if that makes any sense. This translates to the battle system too. If you push the A button when you hit an enemy with your attack, you do more damage, like a second jump attack or a charged hammer attack by holding the control stick to the left. Each attack that Mario and his partner characters can do has some kind of simple input like that that you can do to make the attack as effective as possible. And they're designed perfectly. None of them overstay their welcome, it takes two seconds max, and it always feels good to do. You always feel like you're putting a little extra oomph in your hits, and it's super satisfying 
satisfying. Alternatively, you can guard against most attacks by hitting the A button right as the enemy hits you, and they telegraph their attacks perfectly so you always feel like you have a chance to guard to lose less HP, or take no damage at all in some cases. It's great. Thousand Year Door actually takes this shit to the next level by introducing counter hits and tricks and shit that you can do during attacks to boost your star power meter. It's kind of insane, and it's nice that they knew that this system was so good that they kept it going into the sequel with more bells and whistles. Look, it may not seem like it's that much, but it really manages to make the combat in this game feel really fun. In an RPG like this, you spend a lot of time in battles, and if they were a pain to play, it'd really bog the experience down, I think. We need to look for Eldstar, so let's go talk to Merlin. He's a shaman like Merlevely. He has a reputation in Toad Town for being an old cranky bastard, but everybody respects him because he's real wise and shit. If we're ever lost, we can pay him a visit to ask for directions. The first thing he tells us is that we need to head east, but there are these suspicious toads skulking around and they won't let us pass. We go tell Merlin and he zaps the shit out of them, revealing that they're just the Koopa Bros in disguise. This scene surprised the shit out of me as a little kid. Like, Grandpa's not fucking around. When does this guy join my party, you know? Now that the path is clear, it's time to head east. East. We get detoured slightly because there's this outbreak of fuzzies in Koopa Village and they're wreaking complete havoc on these poor helpless turtle guys. Come on, be nice to them. Have you ever seen a turtle on his back? It's the saddest thing I've ever seen in my fucking life. We help drive the fuzzies out of Koopa Village and we follow them to get back one last shell for this guy named Cooper. Look, it's not the most creative name in the world, but it's fine. It's fine. Look, most of the names of the characters in this game are like puns or whatever. Every toad with a name in this game has a pun for a name. Like the chef woman is named Taste Tea, this little kid is named Lil T, toad that recently beat his addiction to methamphetamines is named Sobriety, you know, etc. Once we get Cooper's shell back, he joins our crew and his overworld abilities that we can launch him forward. I mentioned the abilities briefly before, but they're all fun and they're all essential to beat the game. Other than Goombario's ability, but that one's just nice. It's just fun. Okay, let's make our way into the castle. This is the first dungeon, and it's pretty cool. We'll spend our time here beating enemies that get in our way, find keys, open doors, hit switches, you know, video game shit. We meet Bomette, and she joins the crew as well. I really like all the partner characters in the game, but none of them hold a candle to Goombario, honestly. It just feels best to have a little guy with you that has something new to say whenever you want to talk. I usually spend most of the game with him, because you can only have one partner character alongside you at a time. Anyway, boss time. I think the Cooper Bros shitty fake Bowser robot is really funny looking. Once we beat it, the bridge collapses, and we have to fight the bros themselves. They're not so bad. We can topple them over when they stack up on top of each other, and they have to take a turn to get back up when they fall on their backs. The best strat is to bomb them with Bonnet and then switch to Cooper so he can do his AoE attack to hit all of them at once. This takes a lot of FP to be able to pull off consistently, but if you've been battling most enemies you come across, you should be totally fine and properly leveled up for it. Most RPGs require at least a little bit of grinding, some more than others, but the Paper Mario games are designed against that. You never spend any time battling enemies over and over again just for the sake of leveling up. This is a point of contention for some people, but as you level up and progress through the story, a lot of the weaker enemies give you less and less experience points until eventually they don't give you any at all. The Goomba enemies at the beginning of the game would originally give you 3 EXP points each when you defeated them, but by the time you finish the Koopa Bros castle, they'll only give you one. This is because the game isn't designed to be incredibly difficult at any point, and you'll be able to beat any boss the first time you encounter them. You could argue that this type of design discourages playing this game more than once because you're essentially going to have the same experience every single time, but it definitely hasn't stopped me from playing it at least a dozen times. Eldstar is now free and he'll return to Shooting Star Summit to wait for us to free the rest of the Star Spirits. Now that he's free, we can use his ability Refresh in battle to heal both HP and FP. Each Star Spirit grants us a special ability that we can use during battles. This guy wearing glasses does a powerful attack that hurts all enemies, for example. It's nice that you have a decent gameplay related motivation for saving these guys separate from just wanting to progress the story. The more of these guys you save, the more cool abilities you get access to. The perspective goes back to Peach, and we, now we actually get a chance to play as her. She's being held captive in her bedroom, but we hit this switch, and the fireplace leads into a secret hallway that leads out into another room in the castle. We discover Bowser's diary, and we read it, learning that the next star spirit is being held in dry, dry ruins. It's cute that Bowser keeps a diary. He's a funny guy. They did a really good job making him a lovable goof in Mario RPG, and this carries into the Paper Mario series as well. Surprisingly lovable for a villain. This is the only game in the series where he's actually a villain, by the way. In Thousand Year 
Midori is kind of off doing his own thing, and in Super Paper Mario he's straight up one of your party members. God, I like that game so much. It's so good. Anyway, Bowser catches us reading his diary and he sends us back to our room. Time to play as Mario again. I know I mentioned this before, but I really do love that this game never feels like it's breathing down your neck to quickly move on to the next story beat. You can go back to Goomba Village, check in on Goombario's family, you can practice battling at this dojo, you can talk to Toads to get the latest gossip. It really feels like a world that's alive. Twink lets us know that the next star spirit is in dry dry ruins, so we need to go to dry dry desert so we can find dry dry ruins. <laughs> I hope it isn't too humid over there or anything. I wonder what the humidity level is and try dry. Oh, hell yeah. We get to ride a train to the desert. Let's fucking go. When I was a kid, it always made me sad that Goombario had to sit on the back of the train. What if he gets lonely back there by himself? Oh shit. Okay. We're already there. Never mind. Why is there an egg in this bush. Okay. Since we're in a new location, I'll mention that I love that they put so much effort into these battle screens. There are so many areas in this game that you battle enemies in and they all have unique backgrounds and stuff. It's genuinely really nice looking. Okay, we've got to figure out how to get to Dry Dry Desert. There's this mailman Paracoopa named Paracarry and he apparently is looking for some letters that he dropped. We run around and pick them up for him and he decides to accompany us. Paracarry is probably my second favorite partner in the game because he also contributes to the game's world feeling more alive. If you have him around, you can deliver letters to different NPCs and it's a lot of fun to play mailman. You find letters, scouts, scattered throughout the game, and there's this one particular chain letter side quest that's a lot of fun involving tons of NPCs scattered all across different cities and towns in the game's world. You have to get pretty far in the story to be able to complete it because it requires you to go to some areas that you only have access to late in the game, so having it be in the back of your head while you're playing is cool. It's the type of thing you can just do if you want, there's no penalty for not doing it. Paracarry is going to be your buddy no matter what, but if you deliver letters to people, they'll usually reward you with a star piece or badge or whatever and finishing the chain letter side quest specifically gives you a super rare badge. In the overworld, Paracarry can pick up Mario and carry him over gaps that are a bit too far to jump across, and this is definitely super helpful. We make our way through the mountains and this big buzzard stops us in our tracks. His eyesight is pretty bad, but he's like 75% sure that we're Mario. This part rules because we can just tell the guy we're Luigi and he'll believe us. He'll just be like, oh okay, that makes sense. And fly back to his nest. If you tell him that you're Mario or you try to tell him that you're Princess Peach, he'll fight you though. I usually fight him for the experience points. Right at the start of the desert, this Koopa explorer named Colorado has set up his camp. He and his archaeologist team are apparently looking for dry dry ruins as well, trying to find lost treasure or whatever it is that people that study archaeology do. I don't know. I don't give a shit. Cooper is apparently this guy's next door neighbor back home in Koopa Village and he's excited to meet him out here. That's cute. If we follow the path, we'll make our way to Dry Dry Outpost where we can do a little investigating. I really like this part of the game. It made me feel really smart as a kid because the game doesn't really tell you what to do here to progress. You just kind of have to figure out what to do from talking to people here. We learn that there's an information broker somewhere in town, so naturally looking for him should be our first priority, right? We ask around and eventually find this shady looking guy named Sheik. He mentions that he loves sour fruit. Alright, sure, who doesn't love sour fruit? Somebody else in the town mentions that there's an oasis in the desert so let's go look for that. Once we find it, we see that there are these trees that have lemons and limes. Nice. There's also a super block here. We can use this to level up one of our party members. There are a bunch of these in the game, but I think this is the first one that we can find while playing the game normally. Leveling up one of our buddies makes their attack power go up and also gives them access to a new ability. Pretty cool. We take the lemon back to Sheik and he's super happy about it and decides that he trusts us enough to give us an in with the town's information broker. We have to buy two completely useless items at the shop here in a specific order to get the shopkeeper to give us instructions on how to meet the guy. We follow his directions and we end up on a path on the rooftops of the town and we end up meeting the guy. His name is Mouse Mousetafa? <laughs> Sheik is his uh, alter ego or whatever. He was just testing us to make sure that we were a nice guy before giving us the help we need. He gives us a gem that will beep and light up when we're close to dry dry ruins. Before we go running around in the desert, let's go meet another mysterious babe. This is Merle. She's Merlovelay's twin sister, and she started her business out in Dry Dry Outpost for some reason. Out of the three shaman characters in this game that you can pay for services, Merle's magic is the most powerful. If you give her some money, she'll cast a spell on you that will up your attack power or double your experience points or something else at random. 
It's usually helpful when it happens, but it's like, you know, completely out of your control. Anyway, the desert's layout is pretty big, but it's really difficult to actually get lost. The path in the middle is easy to find, and from there you can either make your way to the right to Dry Dry Outpost, or to the left out of the desert. Wow, cool. Dry Dry Ruins is pretty similar to the Koopa Bros castle. Hitting switches, finding keys, beating enemies, the works. We find a new hammer in here, so now we can break stone blocks and do twice as much damage in battle with hammer attacks. It may seem like I'm skimming over the dungeons in this game, but they're not bad at all or anything. You have a lot of chances to use your partner's abilities to make your way through, a lot of battles, sometimes puzzles that are pretty fun, nothing too difficult or stressful. These puzzles for third graders aren't going to give you post-traumatic stress disorder or anything. The dungeons are fun and good overall, I just don't have that much to say about most of them. The boss in Dry Dry Ruins is Tutan Koopa, and I like that when you beat him his little chain chomp lackey turns on him and chases him out of the ruins like I'm watching Looney Tunes. We free Mamar, the second star spirit, and we get her ability Lullaby. I honestly never use this ability, but the second bar in our star power meter is helpful because we can now use Refresh, the superior ability, twice as much. We get to see how Peach is doing up in the castle again, and this time we actually get to play as her a decent amount, stealthily walking through the castle to see if we can find any clues on where the next star spirit is being held. These sequences are just fine. This might be a controversial opinion or whatever, but most stealth shit sucks in games. Like, even most stealth games suck because they're boring. I tried playing Splinter Cell once and I got so depressed I had to take a 6 hour nap in the middle of the day. These sections are fine though. If you get caught, the guards don't want to get in trouble with Bowser, so they quietly take you back to your room and you can just immediately try again. In the outer hall sections, you've got to avoid the lights from the guards, and in the inner sections, you've got to make sure the guards aren't looking in your direction when you sneak past them. It's not especially challenging or fucking life-changing or whatever, but these sections where you play as Peach don't overstay their welcome, and they're a nice opportunity to organically give Mario the information he needs to progress the plot. Peach eavesdrops on these guys talking about Tubba Blubba, who Bowser has said is invincible. This guy lives past the Forever Forest and is guarding the next star spirit, it seems. These guys Peach is listening in on are talking about how Tubba Blubba secretly has a weakness of some kind. We unfortunately get caught, though, and the perspective goes back to Mario. Before we head towards Forever Forest, let's go exploring a little bit. Another amazing thing about this game is the underground section. Basically, underneath Toad Town, there's the sewer system that's a lot of fun to explore more and more as you progress through the game. There's optional bosses, items to find, upgrade blocks. You steadily gain more and more access to it as you require abilities and upgrades throughout the game. It feels really cool to progress a bit of the story and then head back there to see how much further you can go and what kind of new stuff you can find underground. There's enemies to fight, Goombario constantly complains about how stinky and shitty it is. It's really good. In the sequel, they actually expanded upon this idea like tenfold. The underground is a lot bigger and more fun to explore in that game. Ugh, you know what, fuck it. I'll talk about Thousand Year Door a little bit here because it's kind of the elephant in the room. If someone says they're into Paper Mario, they're usually talking about this game, Thousand Year Door. It's objectively the most important one in the series, and from a gameplay perspective, I'd say that it's the strongest. The gameplay basically just takes everything that the first game does and elevates it to another level. But here's the thing about Thousand Year Door. It's a little bit overrated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Even though it's a bigger and better game, I think a lot of the charm from the first game is kind of lost in translation. Thousand Year Door does things like expanding the battle mechanics and making your partners more compelling and well written, and the world design is honestly a lot more unique and interesting than the first game. But it also does a lot of things that I'm not huge on. If it's been a while since you've played Thousand Year Door, the writing is probably not as cute as you remember. It tries just a little bit too hard to be funny constantly, and it's inferior to the first game's generally sensible and subtle tone. Look, I'm not insane, I'm not gonna say Thousand Year Door is a bad game, because it isn't, it's not even close to being a bad game, but it's my least favorite out of the original three. Super Paper Mario takes things to a completely different dimension, and the writing, art style, and world design are all so absolutely obtuse and weird that it circles back around to being really charming again for me. Anyway, Thousand Year Door is great, but it's not my favorite, okay? 
Okay, glad I got that out of the way. Forever Forest is right outside of Toad Town and everybody talks about it being haunted. We head into the forest and are greeted by this boo that works as a butler in a mansion deep into the forest. He apparently was sent by his master to invite us there, as the master of the mansion apparently has information for us regarding the star spirit. Cool. Forever Forest is interesting. I like the colors and look of it, but I remember it frustrating me a bit when I was young. You have to watch the bushes that sit in front of these gates. The bush that's different from the others in each zone is the one in front of the correct gate to progress. If you pick the wrong gate, you're booted back to the beginning of the forest, but it's not especially difficult. Some of the bushes are immediately very obvious even, but you're doing all this while also dealing with more fuzzies and they're the most annoying enemy in the game. The worst ones are later on during the Yoshi's Island chapter, but all of them are at least a little bit annoying to battle. Don't worry though, while I was bitching about the fuzzies, we made our way through the forest and we've arrived at the mansion. Boo's Mansion is a really neat little area, and in hindsight it's pretty interesting to think about. This game came out 13 months before Luigi's Mansion, and they first teased the idea of Luigi being afraid of ghosts in this game to my knowledge. Back at Mario's house, you can enter a secret panel after you've gotten the ground pound ability and read Luigi's diary where he talks about how scared of ghosts he is. As you progress through the game, he writes more entries talking about how jealous he is that Mario gets to go on an adventure without him, and eventually he talks about how he'd like to star in his own adventure. They knew what they were doing. It's a cute little thing to look back on. Anyway, the mansion is a neat area to explore. There's no enemies to fight, but there's items to collect and use in specific situations to help you progress, and the booze actively tests you in some places. I like this section where you have to grab a vinyl record and play it for this boo that's easily distracted so you can get him to dance so you can get to the chest that he's guarding. After a little bit of exploring, we make our way to the top floor to meet the master of the mansion, Lady Bo. She's super cute. I like that she does a fancy lady laugh while holding up her fancy lady fan. Apparently the star spirit managed to escape Tubba Blubba's manor and now Lady Bo is holding it hostage until we help her. She wants us to go kick the shit out of Tubba Blubba because he's constantly leaving his manor and eating booze. And she justifies this request by reminding us that if the star spirit hadn't escaped, we would have had to go defeat Tubba Blubba anyway. She's not wrong, I guess. She joins up with us to help kick Tubba Blubba's ass and we leave the mansion. Oh shit, it's another desert? This one's actually quite different from Dry Dry Desert. For one, it's a lot smaller and more straightforward. It's also got this very unique atmosphere with all the dilapidated buildings and ghosts flying around everywhere. I've never played this game and gotten annoyed about there being two deserts so close together or anything because they feel very different from each other. Tubba Blubba shows up and eats one of the booze and after seeing this shit happen with our own eyes, it's time to go get this guy. Who the fuck eats ghosts? Why? It's so fucked up. Tubba Blubba's manor feels like a crack shack compared to the really nice mansion that we were just in. This place has dust everywhere, it feels like it's falling apart. It's gross and it's easy to feel really small because of how high all the ceilings are. Bo's ability to make Mario turn invisible comes in handy here with all the security robots flying around and stuff. We sneak into Tubba Blubba's room while he's asleep and steal this key. And this little cutscene and the carnage and destruction that follows it gave me so much anxiety as a little kid. This key starts screaming when we pick it up and Tubba Blubba wakes up. We know that we can't fight him, he's invincible, so our only option is to haul ass out of his manor as quickly as possible. Tubba Blubba chases us and fucking destroys entire sections of his house, trying to stop us from leaving with the key that he was guarding. Jesus Christ, look, all of the security robots are crushed. The desert boos hold the door closed for us as long as they can, but you know they're all fucking goners once he breaks down the door. We've gotta move quickly to get to the lighthouse right outside of Boo's mansion so we can use the key that we found. It's really nerve-wracking making our way there on foot while knowing that there's a two-ton beast chasing after us. It's a really effective gameplay moment. 
Once we unlock the door to the lighthouse, we make our way inside and now we have to defeat Tubba Blubba's heart. This was the big secret of his invincibility. His heart exists down here and he's just an empty shell immune to damage or death without it. Time to beat the shit out of this guy's heart, I guess. This fight is pretty easy if you use Bo's ability to turn Mario invisible. He charges up this really strong attack one turn and unleashes it the second turn, but if you use Bo's ability, she's just like, nah, no thanks. Once we defeat it, we chase it out of the lighthouse and it reunites with Tubba Blubba. We kick his ass pretty quickly too, though. He's not even close to invincible anymore now that he's got his heart back. He goes back to his manor and pukes up all of the booze he ate. Gross, but cool, I guess. Happy ending for the little ghost guys. Yay. Bo decides that she loves adventuring with Mario and decides to stick with us to help us save the rest of the star spirits. She releases Scholar, the star spirit she was holding, as promised, and with him free, we're finished with another chapter in the game. How's the video going so far? Are you having fun? I'm having fun. Thanks for hanging out with me today. The last chapter was a lot of fun, really grand with all the different locations that we had to go through to find the star spirit. This game manages to feel really vast, like a real adventure. It's a really special experience. This next chapter feels quite different, with most of it actually taking place within Toad Town. Once we make our way back out of Forever Forest, we arrive in Toad Town, but things are a bit chaotic. The normally sweet and relaxing music has been replaced with a version of the song at a higher tempo with a bit more of a frantic energy to it, and there are a bunch of shy guys running around, causing havoc. Uh-oh. Similar to the fuzzy outbreak in Koopa Village before, we've gotta bop a lot of these guys over the head with a newspaper and make them run off. A lot of Toad Town residents have had their possessions stolen by Shy Guys, and now we have to go find them and return them. Man, Mario never gets a fucking break, does he? Mario, we need you to save all the star spirits. Mario, the Shy Guys stole my calculator, I need you to get it back for me. Mario, we need you to take this SOCOM 16 rifle replica and hold it above your head in a bed bath and beyond. We're also trying to investigate where the hell the Shy Guys are even coming from, and we eventually use Bo's ability to stake out this empty building for a minute, until we notice a Shy Guy traversing through a secret panel in the wall. Oh shit, magic toy box. This is where they live, huh? Oh Jesus, I'm getting sensory overload a little bit in here. This music makes me feel like I'm at fucking Chuck E. Cheese trying to keep from having a nervous breakdown. Like, I'm not gonna make any observations as to how this toy box's existence is possible or why there are toads living in here. I'm just gonna pretend it's a Narnia thing and move on. The toy box is pretty good. Shy guys are cute. I always liked them a lot growing up. I like the little sounds they make in games like Yoshi's Story and I like their overall design a lot. You know, a lot of Mario enemies are actually insanely well designed. Boos and Babams are designed in a really appealing way, like Kirby and the characters in that series are. Little circle guys are just really good. I theorize that the human brain is predisposed to immediately register little circle guys as friends. It just makes sense to me. We find a key belonging to the shopkeeper in Toad Town in the toy box, and when we bring it back to him, he's so thankful that he lets us take anything we want from his storage closet. The only thing we really need is this toy train. We toss it into the toy box and it turns into a real working train that we can use to travel to different areas within it. I like the rhythm of this chapter, progressing a bit further into the toy box, finding an item or something to take back into Toad Town, and then returning to get a little further along. Some people might complain about this and call it backtracking, but that is not something I've ever had any kind of issue with in video games. If I get to run around, I'm happy. I'm not a difficult guy to please. Once we get far enough into the toy box, we find a big lantern ghost guy. Once we beat him, the light from his lantern escapes, and we're greeted by the next member of our little gang here. Watt is a Sparky, and some people get hung up on their gender for some reason. The game calls them a she most of the time, but then there's a typo later on when you give her an upgrade where the game will refer to her as a he. I personally don't give a shit. They're a baby. I don't care if the little electricity baby is male or female. What I do care about is how helpful they are to us on our adventure, and thankfully Watt's abilities are pretty good. She can light up dark places like caves, and also show us hidden blocks in the overworld if it isn't dark. She's pretty unique because she can give Mario buffs and paralyze enemies, and she's one of the few companions that we have that can attack virtually every enemy in the game, whether they're in the air, on the ceiling, or whatever. Welcome to the crew, little friend. 
At the end of the toy box, we find the leader of the Shy Guys, General Guy. To save the next Star Spirit, we're gonna have to beat them, you know the drill. This fight's a big spectacle, defeating the barrage of Shy Guys thrown at us before the General himself comes out. It's a really fun and flashy boss fight. You know, speaking of flashy, I think a lot of game developers don't really think too much about stuff like atmospheric lighting and particle effects when they're creating the visuals for their games. Art style and animation is important in a game that uses sprites or 2D assets like this for sure, but stuff like the lighting and scaling effects in areas like Shooting Star Summit really, really do a good job of making this game feel more memorable and striking. Games like Hollow Knight don't necessarily have the most incredibly detailed hand-drawn sprites in the world or anything. Although they are really, really nice to look at, that game shines because of its atmospheric effects and stuff. Look, I'm not an artist or an art expert or anything, but I think that a little visual flair really goes a long way in developing a game that's striking and memorable, I think. It's the type of thing that separates a game like Hollow Knight from Bug Fables. We've now freed Muscular, the next star spirit. We're making great progress here, aren't we? Let's go see how things are going back up in the castle with Peach and Twink. There's this fat fuck shy guy hanging out in the castle and he wants Peach to bake him a cake. I'm not intelligent enough to make a joke about how this is misogynistic, so let's just move on. This cooking section is cute. A few timing mini games, and we're done baking a delicious cake. The fat shy guy loves it and tells Peach where the next star spirit is. Looks like we're heading to Lava Lava Island. Back in Toad Town, we head to the west end of the city towards the docks and see our dude Colorado hanging around. There's also this whale hanging out in the water. He's got a stomach ache or something, so he asks us to go in his stomach to investigate. Fine, fuck it dude, I'll do whatever this game wants. You know, I wouldn't normally just walk into any whale's mouth, but Goombario says that he has kind eyes. And you know what? I trust Goombario with my life. So, whatever. Uh, hang on, let's turn the lights on. Uh, I, I really don't enjoy the tongue physics in this part. Oh my fucking god, Goombario, stop talking about how squishy it is. I don't... Uh, uh. There's this little worm caterpillar creature in the whale's stomach that's just jumping around like crazy and giving him indigestion. We kick his ass and then the whale shits us out. <laughs> I like the big dumb whale, he's cute. He's just taking a nap with his mouth open. The whale shows us his gratitude by offering us a ride to any place we want to go. So this is how we're going to get to Lava Lava Island. Colorado conveniently also really wants to go to Lava Lava Island because there's some treasure to uncover or whatever. Sure, he can come along too. I didn't talk about him much before because we just met him that one time in the desert, but he's a really funny character. He's a flighty dipshit that's constantly getting into trouble and his wife is perpetually mad at him because he always leaves home to go on archaeology expeditions without telling anyone. He's also British, which is funny by default. Lava Lava Island is where the Yoshis live. I always feel excited to get to this section of the game because I love Yoshis. Yoshi was always my pick in Mario Kart and Mario Party and stuff. Let's uh, let's start asking around and see if we can get any clues as to where the next star spirit is. Lava Lava Island is a cute area. It isn't exactly breaking new ground or anything, but I think the jungle theme is nice. Paper Mario's locations in general aren't pushing the envelope of environmental design and video games too far. Again, they'd explore more diverse environments and sequels, but I think this game's areas are attractive and nice overall, and they happen to be just unique enough to stand out just a bit above the shoulders of most Mario games that had come out by this time, I think. Colorado is investigating the island for treasure and we have to save him from a few scuffles he gets himself into. Colorado even pokes fun at himself for this after it happens a few times, which I think is pretty funny. The central village on the island is where most of the Yoshis live. There's even an item store and an inn to sleep at and stuff. They probably have a jack-in-the-box and a Best Buy somewhere too, where I can pay more money than anyone should on an extremely underwhelming pre-built PC. One of those stupid long monitors that I don't understand. After investigating to see if we can enter the volcano where the star spirit is rumored to be, we find that it's pretty much completely inaccessible to us. There's a lava pit in the way and seemingly no other entry, so I guess we can head back to the village and ask around some more. Oh god, what the fuck is happening? Why is everyone running around and crying? Apparently the children of the village all ran off somewhere and all the adults are panicking. You're all terrible parents and I'm fucking calling CPS.
Alright, this cheap cheap lady named Sushi, which is actually a pretty funny name for a fish character, not gonna lie, is basically the nanny for all the Yoshi kids, so when we run into her in the wilderness, she decides to join up with us to help us find the kids and send them home. Sushi's ability outside of battle is pretty situational, but it's still a really cool ability. We can ride on her back to traverse water, which was impossible before, and there are even some areas in the game where we can go out of our way to explore places blocked off by water that are completely optional. In combat, Sushi doesn't do too many things that are unique but that's alright. I like her energy, she's just got this really neurotic, midwestern 45 year old mom vibe to her that makes her a pretty funny and welcome presence. We find and save all of the Yoshi babies and they promise not to leave the village without supervision again. Cool. Once we make our way back, we explain to Sushi what we're doing on Lava Lava Island and she's touched that Mario is going out of his way like this to save Princess Peach. And she decides she wants to help us, so she's an official member of our crew now. She's probably been fantasizing about living out a plot from one of her Christian romance novels for years now. Sure, she can hang. The leader of the village is grateful to us for saving the children and he gives us this jade statue so we can find Raphael the Raven and ask him for his help. Raphael the Raven and the Ravens in general being here is pretty cool because before this I'm pretty sure their only appearance in the Mario series was in Yoshi's Island. They're cute little guys, although I don't like that they have feet with, like, toes. It's kinda weird to me. Goombario is also strangely a huge fan of the Ravens. He thinks they're so cute and goes on these little rants if we ask him what he thinks of them. There's even this insanely good little bit here that I wasn't familiar with before where he mentions that he was talking to Cooper about Ravens and Cooper was like, okay weirdo, shut up, I don't care. I fucking love it. I live for this shit in RPGs. I wish this type of interaction between the party members happened more often in this game to be honest. I actually wish this type of thing happened more in RPGs in general. I have quite a few qualms with the Persona series, but one thing I really appreciate about those games is that each of your party members feel like real people and they interact with each other and stuff. I'd love if more game developers making RPGs included stuff like that, it's just really really cool to me. Sorry, let me get back on track here. We put the jade statue into this totem thing deep in the wilderness and we follow a path to this huge tree. It's a striking visual with the camera all zoomed out as you climb. I like it. We make our way to the top to speak with Raphael, the oldest and wisest raven, to see if he can help us enter the volcano. He and his little raven guys all lead the way back to the jungle outside of the volcano and they build us a pulley system thing. I don't know what a pulley is. This is probably a pulley, I think. We use it to get to the entrance of the volcano. Raphael also gives us this red orb that we can use to upgrade our party members a second time. This is super nice, because by this point in the game, Mario is significantly stronger than all of his little buddies. But if we upgrade them a second time, they're almost strong enough to hold their own. It's cool. I know a lot of people prefer the way they handle the partners in Thousand Year Door, with them having their own leveling system and health bars and stuff, but I think I prefer the way they do things in this game. In Paper Mario, your partners can't run out of health because they don't have a health bar. If they get damaged by something, they have to sit out for a turn or two. But you don't waste items or resources managing their health pool or mana or whatever. It's simple and streamlined and genuinely perfect in this game, I think. Okay, that's quite a few tangents now, let's see what the volcano has in store for us. This shit is cool, right? Volcanoes are awesome. The volcano features a decent amount of caves and small puzzles and platforming sections and we get to use a lot of our little friend's abilities here. We find another hammer upgrade in here, upping Mario's attack power even more and now we can break these red blocks in the overworld. Colorado does this Indiana Jones parody thing where this big rock is chasing him but he immediately eats shit. Poor guy. You can tell he doesn't have a bad bone in his body. He just loves archaeology and treasure hunting. He deserves better than this. We make our way into the deepest section of the volcano to fight this big piranha plant in the lava. Honestly pretty awesome boss fight. About halfway through we think we've beaten him but then he sinks into the lava and comes out and he's on fire and shit. Hell yeah. This is the first boss fight in the game to pose a decent bit of challenge I think as well. Sushi's water squirt ability comes in handy here pretty good. Once we defeat him, we've saved the next star spirit- Oh fuck, actually, hang on. The volcano's about to erupt. We need to get out of here. I actually love this sequence because it's one of the few times where you feel like one of the star spirits is an actual character. Her name is Miss Star, and she helps us navigate our way out of the volcano. This definitely cemented her in my mind as being one of the more memorable star spirits, since most of the others we don't really see do too much. I mean, she's also supposed to be this, like, radiant lady with her luxurious ribbons and stuff. Her star abilities that she kisses you on the cheek. Okay. Okay, maybe a few different reasons why she sticks out to me. 
Now that she's safe and free, she returns to Star Haven to be with the other star spirits that we freed. But Colorado has some laments. He really badly wanted to find the treasure deep in the volcano, and now that it's erupted, he's afraid he'll never see it. He's pretty obviously dejected poor guy, but he's dead set on not leaving the island until he finds it. Lucky for us, we saw that the treasure actually landed in the middle of the wilderness after the eruption, so we go find it and bring it back to him. He shows us his gratitude by giving us this seed, which we'll get back to in a minute. We ride Mr. Whale back to Toad Town and notice this thing following us. I guess now would be a good time to talk about this little shit. So you remember the angry infant from the beginning of the game, right? This guy's named Junior Troopa, and he's kind of our rival character throughout this game, I guess? He's obsessed with Mario and is dead set on defeating him in battle, but he always loses to us. It's kind of sad at first, but he genuinely does get pretty strong and almost a little bit difficult as he makes more appearances throughout the game. During this appearance, for example, he thinks that he's got us on the ropes because he's flying in the air with a spike on his head, so normally we wouldn't be able to jump on his head or use our hammer. This is another great example of Paper Mario having insanely good battle design, and more points for the badge system as well because we can approach this fight in a few different ways. Our tight collection of badges gives us a few options here. For instance, I personally have this badge that allows you to jump on spiked enemies. But there are a few other options, like the hammer throw badge. Plus we have a few party members that can hit the guy, like Wad or Sushi. Dipshit just can't win. I also love that Goombario is just like, yeah, this is my shithead next door neighbor. He just works out and orders crap in the mail. I love it, he's the most insufferable type of guy. Like you know he's shown up in Goombario's house, trying to sell Goomba shitty protein powder or G fuel or whatever? You just know he listens to Swan's albums really loud while doing push-ups or whatever. This isn't the last time we'll see this guy, but I wanted to officially talk about him here because he's kind of easy to ignore during most of the game. God, I need to drink some water, hang on. This is the most I've talked out loud in, like, years. Back up in Peach's castle, Peach is getting restless and asks Twink if he feels like trying to sneak out for information again. Twink gently pokes fun at her for this. I find this bit of dialogue to be pretty interesting, actually. Twink is like, wow, Peach, I thought you were more delicate and princess-like than this. You know, like, obviously joking, right? And Peach immediately gets really defensive, talking about how she is delicate and princess-like, like the ministers raised her to be. This is the only time anything relating to Peach's upbringing is ever mentioned, to my knowledge. It definitely raises a few questions. Look, I'm not here to overanalyze anything in this baby game for babies, but it stuck out to me for some reason, and I appreciate any and all situations where these characters get to actually act like characters. So, we sneak out and head into this room before some of Bowser's goons immediately catch us. Instead of taking us back to our room like they should, they offer Peach a slot in this little game they're playing, which is honestly super cute. I like that even the enemies in this game have a little bit of depth to them. They're bored as hell, so they're setting up a little quiz game here, with pedestals for the contestants to stand at and the hammer bro guy being the host and everything. It's great. This is how we find out that the next star spirit is in Flower Fields, and we even learn how to access it. Once the show is done, the hammer bro gives Peach her prize, this magic umbrella that can make her shapeshift. This is going to be fun to use later on, for sure. Bowser shows up out of the blue and goes, hey guys, I want to play too, and immediately everybody's like, oh fuck. Fun's over now, this asshole's here. He sees Peach hanging out with the goons and immediately sends her back to her room. Lame. Whatever. Time to go to flower fields. So you remember that seed that Colorado gave us? It actually came from this guy hanging out in the wilderness in Lava Lava Island. This guy is a babulb? a type of plant that's fully sentient and can walk around and talk and stuff. There are quite a few of them hanging out in different parts of the game, and they each give us a seed. There's this toad tending the public garden in Toad Town, and if you bring her all four of the seeds, this door materializes in the middle of the garden, and it acts as a portal to flower fields. This shit was pretty magical to me as a kid. I like flowers. Flower fields has this really bleak atmosphere to it, with the oppressive gray clouds in the background and the mopey droopy music playing. It immediately feels wrong like, there's something off about it. This big tree guy living in the center of flower fields explains that the sun has disappeared because Bowser's followers have built this machine to make smoggy clouds, effectively bullying the sun out of the sky, so all the flowers are weak and sickly now. There's this shitty cloud guy hanging out up in the sky and he's guarding the star spirit, but in order to get up there we're gonna have to gather together the proper ingredients to make a magic beanstalk we can climb. Before we can do that, we've gotta destroy the cloud making machine and chase the cloud assholes away. This chapter is set up 
up in a way that I enjoy quite a bit. With a central hub and a bunch of linear paths to follow, we make our way down one path and find this flower being harassed by Monty Moles. We defeat them and she rewards us with a magical bean. She's kind of obsessed with beans and seeds it seems. She never plants them, she just like collects them, probably names them and plays with them and shit. All the flower characters in this chapter have something wrong with them, it's really really great. She gives us the magic bean and goes, hey make sure you don't plant it so it can live forever as a little bean. But uh, we're gonna plant it. I'm sorry. She doesn't have to know. We head down all the different pathways and meet different flowers to receive items from them. This lily pad girl is my favorite. She's sweet but also extremely airheaded and forgetful. It's very cute. There's this extremely passive aggressive yellow flower hanging out near this awesome looking crystal tree. And later on we find this rose girl that's extremely vain and narcissistic and she's obsessed with beautiful things. Okay so basically the sequence of events is that we need to meet the lily pad girl to find out that the water has been drained because the water stone was stolen by Bowser's goons. We find the Rose Girl has gotten her hands on the hands? On the water stone, but she isn't gonna give it to us because it's too beautiful and she needs beautiful things to stare at, which I mean, fair enough. When you're a flower that can't walk, I'm gonna assume any entertainment at all is probably gonna be pretty important to you. So we have to go to the passive aggressive flower to get a crystal leaf from the crystal tree to swap it with the water stone to take it back to Lily so we can restore the water in her pond, take some of the water for ourselves and use it to plant the seed that we got earlier from the seed girl. I may have made it sound a bit tedious there, but it's honestly not bad. Also, it's really funny to hear the fucking commentary from these flowers. They're all so shady and toxic, with the exception of the lily pad girl, I guess. This rose girl doesn't give a shit if the other flowers live or die, she just cares about how beautiful she is and surrounding herself with beautiful things. And the yellow flower is so incredibly passive-aggressively negative about every other flower in flower fields. It's amazing. Ah, uh, yeah, Lily? She's stupid. Rosie? Huge bitch. This lady, literally insane. Don't talk to her. I'm not like the other girls. Look at my cool fucking crystal tree. Jesus Christ, do you guys have a fucking Discord server I can join? We find the sun hanging out in this area by himself, and I like that the music becomes spicier here. The sun is understandably depressed about his situation. He feels like a failure. We promise him that we'll go clear up the clouds so he can go back to doing his job up in the sky, providing light and nourishment for all the flowers. On our way back to the hub, we're stopped by this Lakitu guy. He's really cool because he's wearing sunglasses, you see. He's working for the cloud guy that's guarding the star spirit. He challenges us to a battle, but we kick his shit in pretty easily. His girlfriend shows up and begs us to stop fighting and he's like damn shoddy okay. He's amazed by how strong we are and asks Mario why he fights. I like that we get multiple choices to answer with here, but no matter what we say, he decides that he wants to help us on our journey as a way to combat his own toxic masculinity. Respect. He keeps calling himself Spike, but his actual name is Lackalester, which is insanely funny because it sounds like a name that a Lakitu would have if he was a huge dork, right? Like the Lakitu equivalent of Eugene? I'm sorry if anybody watching this is named Eugene, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Lackalester's ability is that we can ride him in the air to move considerably faster, kind of comparable to getting a bicycle in a Pokemon game, and we can also traverse over spikes now. Pretty cool. Oh hey, now that we have all of our party members, I'm gonna do that cool YouTuber thing. I'm gonna make a tier list out of all of them. Okay, fuck. Hang on. Okay, um... Well, Gumbario's my favorite, and uh... Mm, okay, cool, perfect. I do genuinely like every character in this game a lot. I think they're all great. We use Lackalester's ability to get to the cloud machine, and we beat the shit out of it, making the clouds dissipate. This makes the music change to be much cheerier and more fitting of the area, and as a nice bonus, any battles you do in the overworld have a new set piece behind them now, with all the clouds gone. Time to plant our beanstalk and go save another star spirit. Maybe first I should go back to Toad Town and heal up at the inn, actually. Let's go do that real quick. Hello Mario! I like that after we ride the beanstalk to the top, we walk around on clouds. I think that's something every person has fantasized about at least once or twice in their life, right? The background clouds up here being in the shapes of different foods is... interesting? I don't really get it, but it's cute enough. Maybe it's a reference to something? I don't care. Okay, this boss is actually pretty great. The more you hit him, the more little cloud guys come out of him to hurt you. So balancing trying to damage him versus trying to swiftly dispose of his little support squad makes for a fun, kind of tense battle. After we defeat him, we free Clevar, the penultimate star spirit. 
Whew. There's just one more of these guys left, and then we're in the final stretch of the game. Holy shit. Lava Lava Island was a lot of fun. And I know some people are down on Flower Fields because they wrongly think that backtracking is a negative thing. Video games don't need filler. But I like Flower Fields a lot too. The game honestly has not had any real lows, and thankfully I would say the rest of the game just continues to be really good. The next chapter is probably my favorite and I'm really excited to talk about it. But first, a word from our video sponsor, Cherry Blossom LaCroix. You wanna drink the shittiest fucking beverage your horrible greasy mouth has ever tasted? Go to the fucking stupid idiot store and buy a case of this reprehensible swill. Your wife will leave you, your kids will kill you. So this last bit where we get to play as Peach is pretty great. We've been sneaking around as her during most of the intermissions here and now we find finally have something useful in our possession to make it more fun. We can use the umbrella we want at the quiz show to transform ourselves and it feels really great to be able to walk around freely without any suspicion from the guards. We sneak our way to the top of the castle and unfortunately run into Kami Koopa. She openly says that they've prepared for the worst, so even if Mario shows up with all of the star spirits they'll be able to beat him. Before she goes into any more detail, she unfortunately catches us and sends us back to our room. We didn't learn anything about where the final star spirit is, so we're gonna have to figure this out from Mario's perspective. We go to see Merlin to ask for advice because we don't really have any other leads on where the star spirit could be. Surprisingly, he has a visitor. Merlin introduces us to the little ninja guy and they state that they're from Starborn Valley in the cold region of the Mushroom Kingdom. Apparently a shaman that lives there named Merle needs to tell us something very important. And apparently this Merle is Merlin's son. So he's Merlevelay's dad? Cool, I can ask him for his daughter's hand in marriage. There's a pipe somewhere underground that leads to the Shiver region where we can find this guy and talk to him. Let's go find it. Uh, hang on. I gotta get rid of my weed real quick. Alright, now we're talking. I love ice levels and areas in games, and I'm pretty sure Paper Mario is the reason for that. I saw snow in this game before I saw snow in real life, you know? It's kind of a magical thing to me. I love this shit. Look at how cute the little snowman is. Little penguins running around. This is it. This is gaming. Right here. The aptly named Shiver City is inhabited with these little penguin guys. We need to leave the city to find Starborn Valley to talk to Merlin's son, but this penguin is being a huge pain in the dick. Apparently a stranger showed up in Shiver City, so they're on lockdown. Nobody leaves, nobody enters. Well, shit. Suddenly I don't feel very welcome. Are we the stranger? Is it us? Are the penguins... Xenophobic? Oh cool, a key. Let's break the ice so we can get- Oh, okay. This fucking state trooper penguin isn't having our shit either. We're making a really good first impression. I'm kind of uncomfortable now. Let's just go talk to the mayor so we can be on our way. I feel like I'm, a uh, intruding. We enter the mayor's house and his wife immediately is very welcoming of us telling us to go ahead and see her husband if we need to talk to him. Alright, that's nice. At least somebody in this town is happy to see us. Let's go meet her husband. Dude, you good? Oh shit, I think his wife is coming into the room. Jesus Christ, what is happening? Two seconds ago we were having fun in the snow and now there's a fucking corpse in front of us. Oh, come on, dude. No way. Ma'am. Ma'am, please. Ma'am. Gumbario sticks up for us, and the officer agrees not to arrest us if we can find the actual culprit of the murder, but we're not allowed to leave Shiver City until we do. We can't even go back to Toad Town. They've got a penguin blocking the pipe. We're persona non grata now, the number one suspect in this murder mystery. Well, we know that there's that key in the frozen lake. Since the pig is busy investigating the crime scene, let's go get it and see what it opens. Warehouse, huh? These mason jars are cute. There's so many of them in the game. Everybody's just really into pickling things and making jam and shit. Okay, spring upstairs. That's cool. This guy with the crazy eyebrows is named Hemingway. He's a famous author, I guess. 
He wrote a book called For Whom the Bell Tolls. It's apparently pretty good. I never read it. The only book I read as a teenager was Catcher in the Rye 12 times because I was the worst type of teenager. We explained to him that the mayor is dead and since he's known in Shiver City for being a murder mystery novel guy, he's a suspect because this town is apparently full of judgmental dickheads. We follow him back to the mayor's house. Dude? Okay, look, it's nice that the mayor woke up, but holy shit, we were 30 seconds away from the fucking electric chair there. The mayor is awake, and everything goes back to normal, so we ask him for permission to leave the city, and he lets the guard know. Nightmare's over, fellas. Ah, uh, not you. I'm not, I'm not dealing with you right now. I love the music that plays here so much, dude. It's so ethereal and airy and it matches the cold environment very well. The snow falling down around us while we wander around is really nice. Oh shit, it's... Man, what the fuck are you supposed to be, a ghost? We've been to Bo's mansion, okay? This is old news. Whoa, it's a bunch of twinks. I didn't wake up this morning and expect to say that out loud at any point. Apparently the star kids that live in Starborn Valley like to combine themselves to create the illusion of a monster to scare people away. Fair enough, they want to keep this place a secret. If I lived near all those asshole penguins, I'd want them to stay out of my business too. We're greeted by Merle. You can tell he's Merlin's son because his mustache isn't quite as long as Merlin's. His job is to be the caretaker of the star kids that are born here before they ascend to Star Haven, I guess. Pretty noble profession. Taking care of kids is hard. Merlin and Merlevelay and Merle all have it pretty easy comparatively, huh? We all have our crosses to bear, I guess. Merle speaks in a very polite and eloquent manner. I always forget about him whenever I start playing this game, but he's just as interesting as the rest of the shaman characters. You know, Merlin's a grumpy old man, Merlevelay is a sexy flirt, Merle is whimsical and speaks in rhymes and riddles and stuff, and Merlo is just like an excitable little kid. But Merle comes across as a serious, steadfast man. He takes his position very seriously, raising star kids out in the cold. You know, real monk energy. He explains to us that star kids haven't been able to ascend to Star Haven because the star rod's missing. It's just fucked everything up for them. He's been in correspondence with his father this entire time, keeping up with our progress while we've been saving the star spirits, and he knows where the final one is. The final star spirit, Kalmar, came to Merle in a dream, beckoning for help. Bowser hid this last one in a place where nobody can normally access, atop Shiver Mountain. There's a crystal palace up there that's really mysterious. They built it as a temple to worship the stars, but over the years everyone started to forget about it, and now no one knows how to access it anymore. It's a faraway place that hasn't been touched by anyone in probably a few decades at least. A place no one is supposed to be anymore. Very ominous. Merle gives us this scarf that apparently is one half of the key needed to access Mount Shiver. You probably already know what we've got to do if you've been paying attention. Mayor Penguin has the other item. Yeah, it's a bucket. You know what it is already. It's not a hard puzzle, but it's still cool. The snowmen move out of the way to reveal a door, leading to the mountain passage. The mountain has a few enemies to fight and some small puzzles to solve, and overall it seems like this chapter is going to be like the others, and then this shit happens. I've literally played this game like 30 times and this still always catches me off guard. It's so fucking perfectly done. One of these Coopers is a skinwalker, we've gotta figure out which one's real. At first it's not too easy to tell, but then the fake Cooper gives himself away by speaking with rude language. Cooper would never do this. He would never call me a moron. He's a good boy. We whack the fake one and it turns out to be a dupla ghost. These guys are really cool and they're used in ways to really fuck with the player in this series. We make our way towards the palace before we find this star-shaped hole in one of the walls. We find this star-shaped rock being guarded by the spirit of a shaman woman named Madame Merlar. She's Merlin and Merle's ancestor, apparently. She warns us that Bowser's followers have infiltrated the Crystal Palace and gives us the star-shaped stone. When we put it in the hole, it creates this stairway made out of ice. We climb it and we're at the front of the Crystal Palace. I love the way the mirror looks. It's a very unforgettable visual. The Crystal Palace feels cold. More cold than the Winter Wonderland we were exploring outside. It feels dead, empty, lifeless. And the morose song that plays here does an indescribably good job at setting the mood. This is far and away my favorite place in the game. 
Gumbario, this is a sacred place. We're not gonna set up a fucking basketball court. Navigating the Crystal Palace seems a bit daunting at first. It's a bit confusing and easy to get lost, but take a deep breath. We've gotten through every other dungeon in the game. We can do this one too. As we make our way deeper into the palace, it's easy to notice that there's something wrong with the whole mirror thing. When we blow up this section of the wall, the mirrored section doesn't match, and then suddenly our reflection isn't there anymore. Turns out it's not a mirror at all, it's a window. Fucking amazing. It surprised me so much when I first played this. Exploring the mirrored side of the palace gives us access to new passageways to progress deeper, but the Dupla Ghosts aren't gonna let us get out of here without trying to fuck us up as much as possible. We blow up this section of the wall and, uh oh, five bombettes. This one's just a tad harder than the previous encounter with the fake Cooper because none of the bombettes are necessarily acting out of character, but their obvious tell is their punctuation when they're speaking. They all have a quirk when they're speaking to Mario except for the genuine bombette. Bombette is happy that we didn't fall for any of the imposters but still feels the need to tell us that if we fucked up there, she would have exploded on us the next time we took a nap. Yikes. She gives us a little smooch on the cheek though. You know, I kinda skimmed over Bombette before because you get her so quickly after Cooper in the game, but she's a good member of our party. She's a hothead. She's got a bit of a temper to her, which is fitting because she's a walking talking bomb. She has this shitty ex-boyfriend that won't leave her alone and she just constantly calls him a piece of shit. It's a whole thing, I'm not gonna get into it here. I like Bombette, and I like that all the members of our party have a few little moments where their personality comes through. It's not a lot or anything, but I'll take it. We enter this room, and the Dupla Ghosts in the reflection are doing their own thing this time. We follow their lead and then... Oh, come on guys, you're getting way worse at this now. Cooper is so tired of this shit, look at him. We make our way out of the Crystal Palace to the peak of the mountain. The aurora paired with the snow is a great set piece. It may not look like the most amazing thing in the world here, but in the early 2000s on a CRT it looked fucking immaculate. Just trust me on this one. This invisible guy shows up out of nowhere and attacks us. He's the Crystal King. Before we get to his fight, I want to talk about the bosses of Paper Mario a little more at length. So in each chapter, there's obviously a big area to explore. A star spirit to save and a boss to fight, right? I think most of these are done exceptionally well, like Tubba Blubba for example. We spend the entirety of that chapter hearing about the guy, right? From Bowser's goons to the booze in the mansion. They're really hyping up this invincible Tubba Blubba guy, and the payoff is really good. They do the same thing in chapters like Flower Fields and the Koopa Bros castle. You know who the threat is and you spend the entirety of the chapter preparing mentally and physically to defeat them. But some of the chapters don't really do this at all, they just kind of fling a boss at you at the last second. I will say that I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. For example, in Lava Lava Island, the focus of that chapter is really the environment and the exploration, so it being just a big piranha plant at the end is fine. The only two bosses I think there's a bit of missed potential with are Tutan Koopa and General Guy. With Tutan Koopa, there's still quite a bit of environmental focus focus in the desert area and then the ruins, and you do hear a booming voice warning you constantly in the ruins, so I'll excuse that one for the most part. I think it would have been cool if Mustafa told you about a mummy in the ruins or if you heard some NPCs in Dry Dry Outpost talking about it or something, but it doesn't really bother me too much. I think General Guy is the only truly underwhelming boss fight in the game because he's just a shy guy with an army of shy guys and you spend that entire chapter fighting shy guys. I don't know, I'm definitely not complaining. It's hard for me to actually conjure up anything sincerely negative to say about this game, but that's the only boss I don't feel amazing about, I guess. Getting back on track here though, in this chapter I think the boss being the invisible king at the top of the mountain really works, because it adds to the sense of mystery and intrigue really well. You barely know anything about the Crystal Palace and the Dupla Ghosts are constantly trying to trick you, and this theme continues during the boss fight with the Crystal King. He creates holograms of himself to try and throw you off, and he hits like a fucking truck. It's a great boss fight, and the music kicks ass. Once we defeat the Crystal King, we've saved Kalmar, the final star spirit. The perspective goes back to Peach again, but this time it's different, we don't get to play as her at all. Bowser and Kami Koopa get word that Mario has saved all the star spirits and they begin their preparations. Bowser has Peach tied up and is going to take her to the top of the castle to wait for Mario, and Twink decides that today, he becomes a man. He attempts to beat up the guards tying her up and Bowser slaps him out the window. Man. He tried his best. Poor little guy. Now that all the star spirits are free, the portal to Star Haven is open again in Shooting Star Summit. I love the way this visual looks.
So before we get to Starhaven and Bowser's Castle and shit to finish up the game, I want to take a few steps back and get to some of that stuff that I said I'd talk about before. I've been having a lot of fun making this video and talking about this game that I love so much and I'd rather get the negative stuff out of the way now so the video can end on a more positive note, if that's alright. So I've already established that I'm extremely fucking fond of this game, right? Like you just spent the past hour and 20 minutes listening to me suck this game's cock, so I hope you understand that I really like it a lot. I hope I am adequately portraying that to you. Thousand Year Door and Super are also really good, even though they do different things. But things get a bit complicated for me here. I mentioned before that I wasn't a huge fan of how Thousand Year Door handles the paper stuff, because it's not especially funny or charming to me and it shits all over the very subtle tone of the first game. Paper Mario isn't good because Mario is made out of paper and everything in the world is made out of paper. It's good because it's a cute RPG with fun gameplay mechanics and cool locations to explore and lots of interesting characters to interact with. I don't think I've played more than an hour of Sticker Star and Color Splash combined, so I'm just gonna skip to 2020's Origami King on Switch. I got duped by the trailer of this game, I think. I was intrigued by the weird tone and stuff, but when I bought the game and tried it out, I just kind of got depressed. Origami King is objectively a fine enough game, and I understand why more people seem to be into it than some of the previous modern Paper Mario games, but I didn't get past the second chapter before I lost motivation to keep playing it. For starters, the battle system in Origami King is kind of awful. You don't earn any experience points or anything from fights, just coins, but there's a multitude of coins defined in the overworld already, so battles are kind of effectively pointless, and in the brief period I played Origami King, I just wanted to avoid them. What the fuck is this shit? This isn't even a puzzle. Sliding a thing is not a puzzle. I thought I was playing a video game, not a Rubik's Cube with botulism. It's already a fundamentally bad thing for an RPG to have battles that the player desperately wants to avoid, for sure, but as a Paper Mario game? It's not my thing. All the toads that you talk to just make like one-liners and shit, like they're trying to make a funny tweet or something. Fuck off, dude. Cut it out. And tonally, it just feels extremely weird in a bad way. These trees start fucking singing and dancing and Mario does the Harlem shake and shit. Peach is like a zombie. I don't care about this. I don't like this. The first big boss you fight in the game is a box of colored pencils. Jesus. Characters make comments about how they're getting bent out of shape and crumpled up and stuff. I get it, dude. You're all made of fucking paper. You don't have to breastfeed me this shit. You get a partner or two in the game, I think. You meet a bob guy that kills himself or something, which sounds cool theoretically, but I cannot bring myself to give a single fuck about any of this stuff because there's no charm or meaning to any of it for me. Why don't we have characters that look unique anymore? A lot of the NPCs in previous Paper Mario games had a sense of identity to them, even if you only talk to them them once or twice, because they're designed in unique and appealing ways. But now every character is just a generic toad or generic enemy character or something. It just kind of rings hollow. There's no spice, there's no flavor. Nothing that I love about Paper Mario is here anymore. Look, I'm not shitting on anyone that likes this game or anyone that still enjoys the Paper Mario series, but to me, it's not the same series that I love, and it doesn't do anything for me. Not every video game series has to last forever. In fact, a lot of good ones end at some point. But I still lament that the series continues to exist while wearing the skin of what I loved, while being completely empty inside. Nintendo is a company that has produced some sincerely magical and wonderful worlds that I've fallen in love with over the span of my life, and I'll forever be grateful to people like Iwata and Itoi and even Shiggy for their contributions to my childhood. I am partially the person I am today because of the stories and characters I fell in love with as a kid, but Nintendo also fucking baffles me constantly with their lack of understanding as to what makes their properties good or interesting. There's this really depressing interview that I'll link in the description where the producer for Origami King mentions that Nintendo mandated that they're not allowed to modify Mario characters anymore. So that means no more interesting or unique looking characters and they have to make enemies and bosses out of fucking office supplies. It just kind of sucks a lot. And that doesn't even touch on how I feel about Nintendo morally. They have shown to be completely incapable of making their old games easily available for people. The virtual console is a thing of the past and I don't want to pay a fucking subscription fee to play Kirby 64 or Super Metroid on the Switch if it's just gonna evaporate into thin air in a few years when the Switch 2 comes out or whatever, and they go out of their way to DMCA fan games and actively hinder people that appreciate their works. Like that YouTube guy that used to upload all Nintendo music onto YouTube for people to listen to, because Nintendo refuses to officially release their game soundtracks for people. It's just a bummer, man. The N64 and the GameCube are getting older and it's harder to acquire these games physically 
quickly in the wild, and most of these games haven't been re-released or made easily available for people to play legally. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so off topic. I just kind of have a lot of antipathy for Nintendo as a company and I wish they'd be better with how long they've been in the industry. I need to wrap this shit up. I'm done talking about this stuff, let me get back to the fun shit and get this video finished already, Jesus Christ. Star Haven is beautiful. It feels really good to be up here after all the hard work we've put in saving all of the star spirits and stuff. Damn, look at this water. That is some nice water. This big temple is where the star spirits live. It's the same place from the intro cutscene. It's a little surreal to be in here. The star spirits are all back now, safe and sound, and now that they're all together again, they give us the power of the star beam. This is supposedly what we're gonna use to piss all over Bowser's invincibility. They also give us a little blue bathtub that we're gonna fly up to Bowser's castle. I love the little cutscene that plays while we're flying up there. Why don't you try thinking about someone other than yourself, asshole? Bowser's castle is huge. It's the biggest dungeon in the game, and I love that every partner we have gets a chance to shine here. You need all of their abilities to make it through. All of the guests and staff working at Peach's castle are locked up in these cells. I especially feel bad for people that traveled a long way to make it to Peach's party at the beginning of the game just to get locked up. No amount of therapy is gonna help this poor little penguin guy here. Oh fuck, it's Peach. Come on, let's get out of here. We can run away. Oh, wait. Wait. Wait a second. I love that the Dupla Ghosts get one last bit here. I really love their whole deal a lot. Maybe I'm just kind of a dumb guy, but it always catches me off guard when they trick me, and I, I love it. It's a really vivid memory to me, the first time I got tricked by a Dupla Ghost back at the Crystal Palace. This is a bit off topic, but I have this similarly, insanely vivid memory from when I was a really young kid playing Mario 64. I wasn't super good at video games yet, and it took me a pretty long time to gather all eight stars needed to open up the first star door in the lobby. I remember I remember feeling really really good once I did it, like super accomplished. And seeing that picture of Peach at the end of the hallway I was so excited, and watching that picture of her slowly fade into the picture of Bowser as I walked closer and closer, right before the game dropped me down into the trap door was like, a huge moment for me. I can remember that moment like it was yesterday and I probably always will. I gotta stop with these fucking tangents before this video ends up being two hours long. Once we make our way to the end of Bowser's castle we're stopped by the Koopa Bros. Oh whoa, nice. I like when games give you a second chance to fight old bosses. Oh, it's fucking Junior Troopa again. Oh my god. I actually really like that the last boss fight before Bowser is this guy again, honestly. He's such a little pest and his determination to defeat Mario is almost kind of admirable in a way. It makes more sense thematically to fight him one last time. He's the first dude we beat in the game, you know? Makes sense that he's the last one too. Man, how the fuck did he even get up here? With Bowser's castle out of the way, we're finally at Peach's castle at the top. I always feel a lot of different emotions being up here at the end of everything. You start the game out here, and throughout our adventure we've been here so many times as Peach. And with all of the guards and everyone gone, it has a really eerie kind of atmosphere now. We're almost there. We saved all the fucking star spirits. We defeated countless enemies and bosses standing in our way. We changed the lives of people that needed our help. It's time to fucking take Bowser down now. This final set piece is really great, real Final Destination energy to it. No, not that one. Not, not that one. This arena doubly serves as a device to make Bowser even stronger than he already was, and now that he's got Roid Rage, it's time to fight. Bowser uses the Star Rod to make himself invincible again, like at the beginning of the game, but this time we've got the Star Beam. Man, Bowser's gonna shit his pants when he realizes he's not invincible anymore. Oh fuck, didn't work. Oh dear. The perspective goes to Peach and Kami Koopa as they watch the battle. Peach laments Mario's failure to pierce through Bowser's invincibility, and Kami Koopa raises her wand, almost like she's about to strike Peach in the face. Really intense, Jesus. But then the true hero of the story makes his glorious return. Twink! Yeah! Twink! 
Twink unties Peach and Kami Koopa gets back up. This bit here is another one of my favorite parts in the game. It always really excites me. It makes my hair stand on end, you know? Twink is fucking fed up with all this shit. It's time to fight, dude. I love that we get to do a battle as Peach here. It's a really amazing, subversive moment in the game. Yeah, little buddy, you're not afraid of her. This sequence is scripted, with Twink only having one attack option. And at first it doesn't do any damage to Kami Koopa. Peach's only ability is Focus, which is what Mario uses to power up his star power meter as well. As Peach focuses on each turn, wishing with all of her heart for Twink to defeat Kami, his attacks do a little bit more damage each turn, while also taking less damage himself. Eventually... This bit right here, where Twink takes no damage and doesn't fucking flinch at all. I love this moment, when the game's ultimate message reverberates clearly through the player's skull. If you wish for something hard enough, if you're determined to achieve it, if you have people behind you that support you and believe in you, you can do fucking anything. Fuck you. Cammy's like, oh fuck, I'm screwed, and we immediately wreck her shit. Peach continues to wish with every fiber of her being for us to defeat Bowser. Twink joins with the star spirits, and the star beam becomes the peach beam. Oh, that's really sweet, actually. Now that we can suspend Bowser's invincibility, we can get back to finishing this battle. Bowser hits like a motherfucker, but we hit harder. Goombario's charge is the most powerful partner ability in the game, and I let the little guy deal the final blow to Bowser. Yeah, I hope you felt each and every one of those hits. The arena we're on explodes due to instability, but the star spirits use their magic to safely and slowly bring Peach's castle down to the ground. They thank us for everything and fly off, and Twink goes off with them. When Mario wakes up, he's back at Goomba Village, and this toad comes in to tell him all about- I'm just kidding. It's just a little joke. We like those around here. Sometime later, we're back at Mario's house, and Mario and Luigi are discussing the events of the game together, when Luigi brings up your buddies, wondering what they're all up to right now. This bit is cute, showing Paracarry delivering a letter to each of the party members we met throughout the game. Turns out Peach is throwing another party, this time without any interruptions. I love seeing all the partners living their lives back at their respective homes. Goombario is playing with his sister back at his house. Bomed is hanging out in Koopa Village. Sushi went back to Nanny for the Yoshi kids. Cooper actually met up with Colorado after the events of the game to go on archaeology expeditions with him like he always wanted. That's so nice. Paracary shows up to deliver the party invitation though, and Colorado insists that he goes to see the princess like she asked. Paracary also delivers a message to Colorado from his wife, saying that she's divorcing him. Hell yeah, dude. Mario and Luigi also get their invites to the party, and this final section of the game is pretty cute. You're free to wander around two sections of Toad Town, talking to people and stuff, which is really really nice, but I think it would have been better if you had a bigger area to explore in. It kinda sucks that you're restricted like this, but whatever. I think this is my only serious complaint about about the game. There's no post-game at all. The world of Paper Mario is so fun to hang out in and explore, and it would have been so nice if you could go throughout the entirety of the Mushroom Kingdom to talk to people before the party, or after it, or whatever. I don't know. It would have been nice, but it doesn't detract from how much I love this game. It's fun to talk to the few NPCs you're able to see here, although I wish I could talk to Merlin and Merlovely and the other shaman characters, or all my partners for that matter. I want to say hey to Goombario. I miss him. It's been 30 seconds and I miss him. Regardless, the sequence is so lovely and it feels really nice to see all of these characters finally relaxing and having fun in peace. The credits roll after this and it shows everyone in this parade, which is really cute. There's a lot of unique sprites and animations just for this sequence. It's really great. I don't know man, I just really really love this game a lot. It feels like home to me. I didn't even touch on all the side quests you can do in the game. It's sincerely just a beautiful, fun experience with so much content to experience within it. It's oozing with charm and love. I really feel like the people that made it really just wanted kids to have fun playing it, and I think they definitely succeeded. This game was instrumental to me, and it never fails to make me smile and feel a little better if I'm feeling sad or lonely or just having a bad week or whatever. I just think it's really special, and fun, and genuinely wonderful. Yeah, Paper Mario is wonderful. <laughs>